Good morning. We're so glad that you came to worship with us this morning. Would you stand as we sing together? children of our church. Um, earlier this week, Monday through Wednesday, Stacy and I had the opportunity um, for, through the church to be able to go to a youth pastor retreat in Chattanooga. And this was put on by the Scott Dawson um, Ministries. And as we were there, it, the whole conference was geared around youth pastors and their wives or their spouse. And just, it was a great time for us through all the sickness and all the trials we've been through over the last couple of months for us to be able to reset and recharge and be able to come back just kind of fresh off of that. So I wanted to thank you for the opportunity and allowing us to go do that. Also, um, kind of in with that, a praise for us is a few weeks ago, Brother Tim was leading the prayer time and he was asking you to pray for our family, for Stacy and I and Aurelia and the sicknesses that we were going through. And right now, as of today, we're all sickness-free. So that's a prayer request that has been answered. So thank you for your prayers and that and your support along the way. Another announcement is that on December the 3rd at 8 a.m. at the Behringer's house, there's going to be a Christmas party for the young adult class. So December the 3rd at 8 a.m., it's going to be breakfast, and you bring your kids to that also if you're in the young adult Sunday school class. This morning, I wanted to go ahead and continue talking to you about this emphasis that we're having on prayer for the month of October. These concerns are up here on the screen behind me, um, that God would draw people to himself through Buell Baptist Church for our children's ministry for the leaders in our children's ministry, the children that are involved in our children's ministry, 
the, renova the physical renovations that are going to be taking place and also the spiritual growth of the children in our church. For the praise and worship ministry, as Stacy continues to lead in that area and as changes continue to be made in that area, that your, your prayer would just be that God would continue to move in that ministry. Um, the, tonight, our fall festival is from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock, our fall festival for families. And this is going to be a great opportunity for our community to come and walk through the Bible and see the, the gospel message and then also be able to just have um, a fun time fellowshipping together. That's tonight from 5 o'clock to 7. So if you would just be in prayer that God would bring families here who maybe don't have a church home, maybe don't have a relationship with the Lord, and that we would be able to build connections with those people tonight through that, um, through that event. Also, the Friendship Fellowship is going to be on November the 13th. That's a time when um, you're encouraged to spend time that Sunday evening with another family or another person, just pouring into them and building a relationship with those people so that we can plant gospel seeds and just encourage those people around us. Continue to pray for our partnership with Buell Elementary, our Christmas outreach programs that we'll be doing. Operation Christmas Child is a big part of that, and you'll be receiving some more information about how you can be involved with that ministry. And then continue to be in prayer that the Lord would um, lead us to the van that we need to replace the church van that we have. I also have a couple specific prayer requests that have been brought up. Um, Christopher Pate was in an ATV accident, a side-by-side -side accident, and he's in the hospital at UAB. He's a 25-year-old man, if you would be in prayer for him. Um, Jace Marlowe is a six-year-old with acute lymph lymphatic leukemia. Please be in prayer for him and his family. And then in the Sutton family, the death of William Sutton, if you'll be in prayer for that family as well. As, as we go, come to the Lord in prayer this morning, I just want to encourage you, you know, I've been thinking this week, and, and as I'm on social media and seeing what everybody else is posting, a lot of times there'll be graphics for people that are in church, and, and they'll post this meme or this graphic, and it will have just a little topic of information on there. And sometimes those topics are really good, and sometimes they aren't completely rooted in what God's Word tells us. And I've seen a lot of people in our culture today, especially younger people um, in my generation who are kind of, it, it almost feels like we want to demand from God what we want. We want to shout at God. We want to talk to God in a very um, frank way. We want to be very honest with him and just demand from him what we want. And although I, I know that God desires to have a relationship with us that's transparent and open, I still believe that we're called to have a reverent relationship with the Lord and a relationship with God that respects and honors his power. And as we pray, I want us to look at the verses here, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, to see what God's word says about prayer. And we've already spoken about these um, in the past recently, but I want to bring this to your attention again. Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward, will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And here in verse 8 is the section I really want us to look at. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So as we pray and as we're petitioning the Lord for these requests that we have, for the, the life of our church, for our community, also these specific re prayer requests for families who are struggling, families who need to see the light of Christ displayed in their life, I'm asking you to do a few things. First of all, do ask God in faith. Don't just 
lay these at the Lord's feet and say, it's up to you. But show faith that God's going to hear and answer your prayers. Allow God to transform your heart as you're praying. Allow him to, this isn't just about the request and about the things going on in the lives of everyone else. But truly allow God to, to work in your heart as you're seeking him in these matters. Allow God to align his will with your needs. So in verse 8, what we just read, Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. God already knows what we need. And when we're petitioning him for these requests and when we're praying to him, allow God to do a work in your life that aligns your needs with his will for your life. Allow him to do a work on your heart as we seek him. Um, I'd like for us, I, I talked to Brother Tim about this. It was He was the one that felt the Lord calling to do this month of prayer in October and fasting and seeking God for these things. And I would like to continue that through Thanksgiving. And so I hope that as we continue to pray and seek God through these things, that we can continue to praise God for the prayers that he's answered along the way. And even though we may not bring up the matters every week, in each of our lives, God is answering prayers every day. And so I am asking you, make note of these things over the next month or so that God's doing in your life, the small things. Be looking out for the things that God's doing, that he is working through your life every day. And I promise you, as you begin to seek him and as you begin to look for what he's doing, you're going to see God written all around what's going on in your life. And then on November 27th, I'll be preaching that Sunday. And I'd like for us to be able to spend some time that day just praising God and thanking him for what he's doing in the life of our church, in the life of the individuals here, and in the life of our community. So right now, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. presence here today with us. Lord, I, I, I'm thankful that we don't have to stand and scream and shout for you to hear our voice, but that even in the quiet, most still moments, that you can hear our pleas and our requests to you. Lord, thank you for the ability for us to come to you and, and share our heart with you. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the hearts and minds of each soul in this room. Lord, I pray that as we continue to seek your face, seek you in each of these matters, that you will continue to fill us up, encourage us, and show us each day how you're working in our lives, Lord. Show us how you're working in the life of those around us, of the people in our community, the people we go to work with and go to school with every day, Lord. I pray that you would just... Um, reveal to us, even in the darkness, Lord, the work that you're doing among us. And I pray that as you reveal that, that 
we would continue to be encouraged and we would continue to be able to give you the glory in each of these matters. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship together this morning? week when we were at that conference, a pastor, um, his main sermon was on remembering the time that you met Jesus, going back to the time where you met him and you were saved. And you remember that spark where you were just set on fire for him and you were so close to him. We're about to sing this hymn, um, Amazing Grace, and it goes into the chorus of My Chains Are Gone. And I want you to think back to the time where you lost those chains. And just try to take yourself back to that moment where you met Jesus as we sing this song.
the sun forbear to shine but god who called me here below will be forever mine will be sing Jesus loves me with me as the children are dismissed and the choir is dismissed. Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so little ones to him belong they are weak but he is strong yes Jesus loves me Father, I don't feel worthy to be up here today. Maybe just this one day, but that's not the case, Lord. We're never worthy to do your work. We don't always have the right words. We don't have the right spirit. We don't have the right heart. And so, Lord, whether it's right now, me standing in this pulpit, or us going out into the community, Lord, we're not worthy. Lord, we're imperfect. We make mistakes. We say stupid things. And Lord, time, many times we run ahead of you when we ought to slow down and listen to you and just allow you to work. And Lord, this uh, focus we've been in on prayer for this month and going on into November, Lord, it reminds us how hopeless we are to accomplish anything for you. And Lord, just like today, we may do some neat things this afternoon but really the, the it boils down to the fact that it's your pleasure and your will whether anything is accomplished through it or not so we commit that to you as well lord may you speak to our hearts in this service today and may you encourage us knowing we've met you in jesus name amen if you have your bibles turn to the book of matthew chapter 7 and while you're turning that i got to straighten up some smart addicts I gave you all this little prayer request, uh, Tyler, that you alluded to a few minutes ago, and several people had asked me about the wording in that. Number two says that our children's ministry get untracked, and then that our worship team get back on track. It sounds like those are contradictory things, so y'all got me doubting myself, so I went and looked up in a dictionary just to make sure that I was not crazy. And it says to track something is to be headed in the right direction. Now, would you all agree that the choir and the praise team needs to be headed in the right track direction? And then the, the, the thing that our children's ministry get untracked. And in the dictionary, it says it's escape from a slump. And we all go through slumps. So those words for you smart ex, every Tuesday morning I get abused when I go to our men's Bible study and they find a way to, to just kind of pick on my, my shortcomings and my failures. And John Burroughs up there, he, last week he said, that must be a Louisiana word or something. And Danny agreed with him that uh, untracked is not a word. Y'all, it is in the dictionary. So y'all come to the altar and get right with God. When you, but uh, if we can't laugh at ourselves, we're in trouble, aren't we? So we look forward to sharing with you in these next few minutes. Thank you so much. I love you all, and, and we laugh together and, and serve the Lord together. One of the historic things that has occurred in American history occurred in San Antonio at a place called the Alamo. I think it was 1836. There was 100, and they don't even know exactly how many there, somewhere around 150, 175 Texans who stood there against Santa Ana and the Mexican army to fight for the independence of Texas. 
And on that day, the commander of those men, man by the name of William Travis, stood up and he did something, and you'll see it on this little video. Russell brings bad news, men. The defense of the Alamo rests on us alone. Now, I won't minimize the gravity of our situation. General Santa Ana has nearly 5,000 men massed against us. Now, I can't force you beyond patriotism and your own conscience. While it's still dark, there's time to slip off to safety. I won't blame any man who doesn't stay. Those who stay, cross over the line. Boys, I don't think I can make it myself. I sure would appreciate it if somebody had to help me across. So William Travis drew a line in the sand and said, all of y'all who are committed to staying and fighting for our independence, step across the line. We've been doing a series of studies on Sunday mornings, which I wrap up today. And Jesus had called his first disciples, Matthew 419. We know that passage by heart. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so today we come to the last few verses of this passage. And in this, really, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus drew a line in the sand. But it really comes out very clearly here today, beginning with verse 13 of Matthew chapter 7. And, and I want to show you today in this passage of Scripture three things that happens when Jesus draws a line in the sand and you're willing to step across that line and follow him. And so I'm going to break this down into three bite-sized segments and look at each one of them for just a moment. And then I want you to look at your heart today and ask yourself, Lord, am I willing to step across the line to accept you, to serve you, and to live for you, even though it may cost me something? So here are the three things. Number one, a person who chooses to walk across the line and to serve and follow and obey Jesus Christ has made a deliberate decision. He's made a deliberate decision. Now in life, we sometimes make decisions, and they have to be deliberate. You made a deliberate decision if you're married, that you're going to marry that man or that woman. Uh, if you've been off to college, you made a deliberate decision that you're going to go to a certain college. And the list goes on and on of deliberate decisions that we make. Now look at what Jesus said to these men, verse 13 and 14. You'll see it on the screen. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So Jesus said millions of people are choosing the wide road. But he said if you want to follow me, you've got to be willing to make a decision, a deliberate decision to go down a narrow road that not many people choose to go down. Last Monday I carried some of the boys from here at Buell up to Bankhead National Forest. And, and if you've never been up there, the, they say it's the largest tree in the state of Alabama. I was going to bring a picture showing these guys holding their hands together. But this tree is 24 to 26 feet around the circumference of it, and it's 150 feet tall. 
And so we got up there to make our little journey into the wilderness and go to this tree. And I told the guys, I said, guys, this is not going to be an easy hike. And it ended up that it was 10.5 miles. You, you can't drive there. You've got to walk. Now, here's what's interesting. When we started our hike that morning, we saw one man. And when we got back to our car that afternoon, we had seen no one except that one man and then our group of five people. That's kind of how it is when you follow Jesus Christ. It's, it's not always the crowd that's going that way, but Jesus says, guys, I'm drawing a line in the sand, and I want you to make a decision. Are you going to follow me, even though it may be lonely, even though it may be demanding, even though it may be difficult? And he says that here in verse 13 and 14. We make a definite decision. Now, we as humans have, some, have shown ourselves that we tend to want to go where the crowd is going. I'm sure all of you know who Chuck Swindoll is. Chuck Swindoll said that there was a, a, a story several years ago that occurred. A, a psychologist by the name of Ruth Berenda did a test. And she wanted to determine how people respond when they are in the minority. And here's how the test went. Ruth Berenda, the psychologist, put three boards on the wall, and she put three different lines across each of those three boards. And she told this test group, there was ten students who went into that room, and each of the ten students was to identify what was the longest line on the board. The only thing was, nine of those students were told in advance which was the longest line and told that they were to vote for the second longest line. So they bring these 10 students into the room and they show them, they said, look at these boards. And they said, there's three lines, a long one, a medium, and a short one. We want you to tell us which is the longest line. The nine students who had been set up, they pointed at the medium distance line. The one poor sucker, I guess that's what it was, the one poor sucker who did not know that they had been set up they voted along with the other nine for the line that was not the longest. They were supposed to be voting for the longest line. They did that test, uh, I forget how many times, but every time they found out that nobody likes to be in the minority. And listen to this. 75% of those tests show that people will not go against the majority even though they know they're wrong. And that's what Jesus was teaching. Remember this. Jesus had chosen his first 12 disciples. He wanted them to be sure that when they went out to preach the gospel of God and about him dying on a cross, that he wanted to be sure that they were solid and they were secure. And he says, guys, I'm drawing the line of the land. I want you to make a deliberate decision that you will follow me no matter what the cost. He said, millions will go the other way, but only a few will choose to follow me. So let me ask you a question today. Can you look at a time in your life when you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ and follow him unapologetically? You know, we can, most of the time we can, we can identify the day and the hour when we got married, if we're married, we can remember what year we graduated from college. And there's a lot of other things we remember. But folks, we ought to be able to look back at a time when we made a deliberate, distinct decision, not just to, to believe in Jesus with our head, but being willing to follow him with our heart and do whatever he asked us to do. And that's not just some casual, come-as-you-will commitment. It is, a, it is a solid, demanding, challenging decision. Because many times you will be in the minority. I'm not trying to be negative by saying that. You know, nobody wants to be a round uh, peg in a square hole. But the fact is, friend, when you choose to follow Jesus Christ, you ought to think differently, you ought to act differently, and you ought to be a different person because you made the decision to be born again and for Him to come into your life. So my question today, have you been born again do you know Jesus Christ, and have you committed your life to him? That's the first thing that happens when he draws the line in the sand. 
And then the second thing that he points out here, and we, we discover in this passage of Scripture, is a, a distinctive lifestyle. Look at your Bibles. In verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. You know, sometimes... Looks deceive. Uh, I was blessed about, I guess it's been 30 years ago, to make a trip down to Brazil. And uh, I had always heard about piranha. Have any of y'all ever seen a piranha? You, you know the story of them. They're, they're deadly fish. A, a group of piranha fish, you, you can kill a cow and throw it in the water and they'll, they'll cut all the meat and all the hide off that fish. And just So I, I had this vision of these Huge, monstrous fish that were just vicious looking. And I got to see a piranha down in, not up close, thank goodness, down in Brazil. And they look basically like, except for the fact that they've got kind of sharp teeth, they look like a brim that you might catch out of Sipsi River or Lake Lurleen or somewhere like that. They, they are deceiving just to look at them. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Looks are deceiving. Now notice what he does here in this passage of Scripture. He says there's some things that you can identify in a person's life that is, that is not evidence that they are my follower. Look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus said, looks are Deceiving. Now, y'all have heard me say this, folks. Here in America, Christianity and followers of Jesus Christ is nothing like it looked like over in the early church. The early church, if you confess Jesus as Lord and followed Him as a believer, it could cost you your life. Now, that doesn't happen in America, thank goodness. But on the other hand, where there's not persecution at, sometimes things get a little bit flimsy. And so Jesus says, there are some people who say, I called you Lord. And, and folks, you know and I know that there are a lot of people who say, I am a Christian. And friend, there's more to being a Christian, just saying a simple prayer of, Lord, I want to be saved. It's when you make an allegiance to Jesus Christ and you say, Lord, I'll follow you no matter what it go, where he goes, what it costs me, and what I do. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you to pray for this need in a few minutes. About two weeks ago, I asked you to pray for Matt Watts. He's a Southern Baptist missionary serving over in Myanmar, Myanmar, or whatever it was. And uh, he had this rare disease. It's similar to malaria, but it's more vicious than malaria. Well, this morning I got a text from Matt, and now his wife and several of his children have that same disease, and they're having to carry them to the hospital. Now, here was my point that I said to the men this morning and in my foundations class. Think about that. Here is this missionary couple who goes to this third world country they get locked down over there for COVID for almost a year, stuck in an apartment with five children and can't get out except to go get food. And so they're locked down. They come home and spend just a few months here in America and they go back overseas. And then when they get over there wanting to get their feet on the ground, they get struck with this horrible disease. Now, you may be thinking, why in heaven's name would anybody do such a thing? Jesus tells us the answer there in verse 21. The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Friends, Jesus Christ, number one, says, if you cross the line and are willing to follow me, 
there's been a distinctive decision in your life or a deliberate decision. And then number two, there's a distinctive lifestyle that you're living and you're willing to follow him and serve him in that. And then number three, you're being given a clear destination. Look at verse 24 through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Every time I read that passage of Scripture, I think, think about the story of the three little pigs. All of us know that. No, we're really getting spiritual today. The three little pigs. One little pig built his house out of straw. And the wolf came along and he huffed and he puffed and he blew his house down. And the second little pig came along and he built his house out of sticks. And the big bad wolf came along and he huffed and he puffed and he blew his house down. But the third little pig built his house, uh, I, I like to say, out of bricks. And the big bad wolf came along and he couldn't blow it down. Friend, that's what Jesus Christ is saying here. When your life is built on the foundation of me, then it's going to be solid. I have some friends that went over to Japan. Y'all remember when the tsunami hit Japan some, I don't know, 15 or so years ago, maybe 20? And these friends were Southern Baptist disaster relief workers, and they went over there to Japan to kind of look and see what they might can do to help. And when they came home, they showed us slides of their work. And so they showed us, I'll never forget this picture as long as I live. They showed us a picture of this little village there in Japan, and there was not one stick still standing on those little homes. But you know what was there still? The foundation of the houses. And those Southern Baptist disaster relief workers said, you know, in life, if your life is built on Jesus Christ, you may lose a lot of things, but you won't lose what the foundation is built on. And so Jesus is saying to his disciples in this passage of Scripture, if you made a deliberate decision to follow me, and you're willing to submit to this distinctive lifestyle that, that's not based on words, it's not based on what denomination teach you, it's not based on church, but when your life is built on the distinctive foundation of living and serving and following me, you're going to have a clear destination of where you're headed and the foundation will be solid and it'll be secure and it won't ever go away. And so this story ends the passage uh, of what's called the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus has basically called his disciples and he's drawn a line in the sand and he says, guys, are you ready to follow me? And so I want to go there today with you and ask you the question. Have you made the decision to follow Jesus Christ? I'm not asking you that you pray some little simple prayer. Lord, I want to be saved. That, that will save you if, it, if you mean it in your heart. But when you make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, it means you're willing to live Him with your life. You're willing to obey Him. You're willing to serve Him. You're willing to go where He wants you to go and do what He wants you to do. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Because when you follow Jesus Christ, you are finding a purpose in life. You know, things that we give our lives for in this world don't last. You know, every one of you has a job. And that job is wonderful because it, it pays for your home. It pays for your clothing. It pays for food to go on the table. But that's not a purpose in life. One of these days, you're going to outlive that purpose. You know, we all get fun, have fun and, and laugh and joke about sports teams. You know, like Alabama lost here. That's unbelievable. And I told you this morning, I said, there's going to be a lot of depressed people around town tomorrow. But, you know, we get so caught up in things like sports and get caught up in things like hobbies. And we get caught up in all those things. But they're really not a solid foundation. They're, they're not your purpose. They're not your reason for living. Jesus Christ 
should be and ought to be your reason for living. So he comes and he, he gets right up in the face of his disciples and said, Guys, I'm drawing a line. How many of you are willing to step over the line and not just believe in me, but live for me? And I don't mean to insult anybody today, but I'm, I'm sure that in a group this size, there are some of us who've never made a decision to live for Jesus. I'm not talking about some little simple prayer. I'm talking about you stepped across the line and said, Lord, I accept you as my Savior, and I want to be born again. But, Lord, I'm willing to live for you. And even if it should mean die for you, that's what it's all about. Let's pray together. Today I offer a simple invitation to you. Jesus Christ, not Tim Patrick, not Buell Baptist Church, but Jesus Christ is still offering the invitation to people. Now, you won't ever be one of the twelve like they were. They were a distinct group. But he still offers the invitation to live for him. So today, I just invite you, number one, make sure that you've asked Jesus to come into your life and to save you. You know you're going to heaven because of that decision. You know he keeps his promises and he's keeping his word. But as a part of that today, have you taken that extra step in your faith walk to say, Lord, I'm willing to live for you. I'm willing to serve you. I'm willing to die for you even if that's what that means. In just a second, after we've had prayer, Stacy's going to lead us in this song, and I invite you. Maybe, maybe today you feel a need to come and kneel at the altar and just pray. This is a prayer time. Maybe today you need to be born again. You'd come and whisper to me, say, Brother Tim, today I need to be born again. As we sing, let God's will be done in your life. Father, we give you credit, we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen.